we're going to be joined now by Brother Terrell Starr, who is actually coming to us from Ukraine. Um, first of all, good morning, brother. Thank you for joining us. I know you are in a war zone right now. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. And I moved from Kiev, which is the hot spot that's being bombed, literally uh, civilian targets. Uh, have, are being bombed more intensely than I uh, did than when I was there a few weeks ago. I am well. I spoke with my therapist yesterday. I am in good spirits. I'm in positive spirits. And <clears throat> I'm in the city of Lviv. Um, we have our own, you know, um, sirens going off about potential bombings of this city and the region. But uh, otherwise, I'm fine, brother. I appreciate you having me on. No, we appreciate you being willing to do this, man. We've been, um, we, our entire team, we've been praying for you and pulling for you. We know, um, well, we don't know what you're going through, but we can imagine what it is that you're going through. Let's get to what's happening. Tell us how the Ukrainian people, their resolve, because there's, there's mixed news coming in. Like the Ukrainian soldiers are holding the line, right? They're fighting. Um, but Vladimir Putin is still pushing nonetheless to give us an update on where everything is. Thank you. So, so here's the bottom line: the Russia, the second most powerful military in the world, is losing this war. They are losing thousands of troops. They are being killed. They are being slaughtered, actually. And I know in the Western press you don't see that, but in the Telegram, uh, Russian and Ukrainian language Telegram, you see just bodies of Russian soldiers splayed on the ground. I mean, it's it's, it's pretty brutal, and I don't think you really appreciate how badly these Russians are getting beaten here because this is their land and this is what the Ukrainians are fighting for. And they are defending it um, with sheer strength. I mean, they're basically being, they're basically ambushing uh, a lot of these Russian uh, troops that are coming in guerrilla style. And so it, they're just chopping them up bit by bit from a, now what's happening though, is that since they realize, since Russia, since Putin realizes that his ground forces are not winning then he's just bombing this place, hopefully into submission. But I'm telling you, I'm here and these people will die to the last human. Uh, mm. The way that the Ukrainian attitude is, is that we would rather, the language that's used with me specifically is, we would rather die um, defending our land than to live to be your slave. That That's the mm. language that is used toward, you know, with me. And I have, and it's very difficult because I have friends of mine who saying, hey, listen, I'm going to go get an automatic shotgun. I'm going to kill all these Russians that come in and try to take my land. And you're talking to somebody who you love and who you spent all these years developing a relationship with. And you're looking at the possibility that you're not going to see them again because they're going to go off and volunteer and fight and not come back because it's war. So I'm fortunate enough not to have anyone directly to die from this. I've had friends who come very close to being hit with Russian artillery. I mean, I've had that mm. a number of mm. times, like very close friends. And, and listen, if that would have happened to me, I don't know if I would be in a condition to talk to you or anybody, but right. basically, right. You, you know, but, but, but basically uh, there is a great deal of resilience here and people. And, and so I'll tell you the most heartbreaking thing that I've seen just today. I went to the train station Um just to see what was going on there. And the train station that I travel through often here in Western Ukraine and here in Lviv is now a site for ref for, for tens of thousands of refugees. And wow. you have buses that are, are, you have these huge long lines of mostly women and children because you know, the men can't leave. Right. And so you have these men going with their, their wives, their girlfriends and their children to the whatever border that's that they'll go through be it poland hungary slovakia um romania and or no poland and um they'll get up to the mm. border and that's where they end with, with the men because they have to see their their women and children off because in war you know just being realistic it's the women who choose not to fight you, the women and children, you have to send them off because ultimately in a war situation, when it comes to starvation, particularly dealing with elderly people, those are the first people to go and they, you know, you just have to send them out of that environment. And so right, you have these right. men, these families being torn apart and, you know, and so just looking at um, 
all these people, you see these lines where food is being served and it's, it's heartbreaking to see people being displaced. And so, yeah, man, tragedy, man. Yeah, no, I was going to say displacement by itself. Displacement is an evil thing by itself. You add on top of that uh, mortars and artillery rounds and 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 bomb strikes. Um, what Vladimir them. Putin is doing. Go ahead. I hear them. Yeah, no, I'm saying what 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 Putin is doing is most certainly visiting an evil, not only on Ukraine, but the broader international community. I want to talk about the geopolitics here. Um, the conversation that Zelensky had with Reuters suggested that the possible path to peace would be through security assurances that were not a part of NATO, saying that there may be an alternate route for Ukraine to get security. Do you have any insight into that and how that may play out? Yeah, so I say I, I'm I'm happy you asked me that question, brother. So, you know, and I've been on your show, and we talked about imperialism, military, industrial complex all the time, and you know how I feel about it, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. what, yes, right, where I stand, right. And so the the larger issue here, though, is that I'm going to give you this important context because it helps to answer your question. There is a difference between the NATO that was formed after World War II. The NATO that you know that that went that that um that's notorious for going that you know for Gaddafi all these other things and so um there's a difference between that NATO versus the NATO of these post-Soviet post-Warsaw Pact um, um relationships of the 1990s and so mm. so so Hungary um, the Baltic states Poland don't come from that imperial they they didn't join nato as part of that as far as the genesis of that imperial framework they did it solely to protect themselves against russia now here's the okay. thing do they benefit from that imperial framework yes they do let's just be clear yeah but they didn't enter because of that you get what i'm saying and so i get think, it yeah so so when you think about security it means something very different to them than some of the larger moral questions that are being brought up in the U.S. Congress by members of the squad, et cetera. You know, and I think that's an important distinction we need to make. It, it, going specifically to your question, though, is that NATO was a found, you know, NATO was formed primarily um, as an alliance against the Soviet Union against Stalin's Soviet Union after World War II. That is true. The problem is that the union that we're that 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 they were um, formed against composed of many of these countries, right? Mm. That, that don't make up that union anymore. And part of nice. it is that, and, and not only that, they didn't want to be a part of that union. They were forced, and so that's when they went fleeing essentially to eu and to nato because they knew that they're because they did not want to be ukraine and so when you mm. look at you know do i see is there any alternative to a nato no because if they if there was an alternative to it then russia wouldn't have attacked and mm. so 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 basically you're just giving now i'm just telling you the energy here virtually everybody that you talk to on the streets of ukraine if you do any polling they all want to join nato and they mm. want to do it for the sole purpose of making sure that this what's happening right now won't happen in the future and so mm. you know so there are talks going on right now to kind of end this war which putin started because again ukraine didn't do anything to start this war zero that's right so so, so that's the bottom line they didn't do anything so basically, I don't see what an alternative security um, option would look like because NATO is not necessarily saying that you can never join. They're just pretty much without well, within a few words, and we're not going to let you do it now because of the complications with Russia. But when right. you think about it, but but I'll close out by saying that when you look at what does security look like, I mean, when you're constantly bombing a place, I mean, you're committing war crimes. I mean, because trust me, what I've seen, witnessed, they're war crimes. I was just speaking mm. with a guy yesterday who, you know, he came over to visit, you know, visit us. <clears throat> he was in a suburb of Ukraine, very well-to-do guy. And he, when, when he went to his house, he saw Russians in his house looting. And wow. 
Yeah, yeah, and looting and saying we're gonna do all this stuff to your wife and all this. Stuff. Yes, you know, and so you run into that all the time. And thank God they didn't do anything to her and to him because they've been doing that. And so, you know, across this, you know, in, in the East in particular, I don't, when you think about security, it's difficult to talk to somebody. It, it'd be like, you know, talking to uh, Ukrainians, talking to Putin about security. Mm. It's like mm. black people talking to the NYPD about how, you know, <laughs> hey, we're going to make it safe. I mean, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so let's let, I want I want to I want to piggyback off of that last thought uh, or after, after your first thought. Right. One of the first things you said was how many Russian soldiers are dying. I can't imagine that this is playing well for the hardliners in Russia who support this war because it's embarrassing, right? At this juncture, they have to be embarrassed. How does this play out internally? Does Vladimir Putin have a strong enough hold to survive this embarrassment and not only this embarrassment, but this um, all out catastrophic situation that he himself created? Bro, that's a that's an interesting question. So here's the thing, because there's a dirt, such a dearth of independent media and, and, and a crackdown on just civil society and civil liberties in general, <clears throat> it's hard to really, I mean, all the internal polling shows that the local population supported, support the war and supported mm -hmm. like this annexation of Crimea. Um, but at the same time, when you see Russians on the street being asked about this, there are a couple of things that you look at, right? So you look at the literal translation of what they're saying, because, you know, you see this in Western media. You see Russians saying being indifferent. But what I also see are Russians who are terrified of saying the wrong thing, lest they be mm. thrown in jail. I mean, because people yeah. are thrown in jail if they show any type of opposition to this war. I mean, that has to right. happen. And so that happened with the uh, that host, uh, Marina. Um, uh, I can't pronounce her. Uh, Ovis Com I can't pronounce her last name. The host on Russia uh, radio television uh, that protested yeah, yeah. and was arrested. Yeah. yeah so, so, so another Go thing ahead. is that, but more, more specifically to your point of this is not looking good. They didn't ex look. The crazy thing about white supremacy and what I would call like this Russian supremacist mindset, because they have their own form of a supremacist mindset. I call this a Russian supremacist mindset um, that they have towards Ukraine um, mm. is that you severely underestimate you in, de in dehumanizing the people that you're targeting. You underestimate them. And you think you can do whatever you want to them. Right. And so these people, I'm telling you. They're getting a like, rude awakening. Well, they, I guess uh, okay, awakening is not the word. That's in the severe under, <laughs> understatement. So like walking down the street, people will walk up to you. I mean, they've walked, I've had people walk up to me and their greeting was Putin is a dickhead. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, in, but the thing about it, like profanity in Ukrainian or Russian is a lot worse than it is in English. Mm. <laughs> so when somebody says that to you in there, no, it is like, or, or so for example, when you like a common refrain here, and this goes, I'm giving you important cultural context because you need this right. in order to understand what's going on. And so like any type of profanity in Russian or English is really awful. Right. And it's like, you want, it's like fighting words. And so like the phrase, okay. kind of like, go, like, go fuck yourself. Like, it's like a refrain. I mean, Americans say it, but literally when a Russian says it, it's like I literally want you to go find some place and search your like they they <laughs> it's a very graphic it's a I very graphic it. but I'm saying yeah. this to you because when you're on the street and people say this to you it just shows you how far it has gone okay and then mm. you also, and then you also because again how many people go to some foreigner and say Putin is a dickhead and use that language but it just shows you the energy that's happening here and. I've had people come up to me and I'm doing my own little thing with my selfie stick and they'll say, well, hey, um, they'll come up to me and say, hey, only Ukraine is going to win here. Fuck Russians. We will kill all of them. And mm. I mean, that, and so it's not just a thing. Against, they have a disdain for what they what they say is a slave. And again, I'm using their words, right? Like a slave mentality right. in Russian society. I can't find a single friend 
and and or a single person that I've encountered on these streets. And there is not a part of this country where I have not been. Okay, mm -hmm. that that where where people are saying it's just Putin. No, they're saying even if Putin goes down, we still don't trust y'all because mm -hmm. y'all are willing to die for our freedom and you aren't. And so that's and so when you look at this whole thing about they're being embarrassed, they don't know what to do because the problem now is that they Russians are saying they have 498 people that they've confirmed dead. I think those are the 498 bodies that have gone into Russia. When more of those mm. body bags go home to their mothers, because you get the intercepts of these soldiers, because many of them are conscripts and not real, like hardcore soldiers, they're calling their parents and they're crying. They're getting upset and saying, hey, we can, you know, they're, they're, they're killing us, they're slaughtering us. And so, yeah, they're going through a state of shock right now. I want to talk about some of the propaganda uh, that is infesting the West and if it has any bearing on what's happening over there, or if not, let's talk about that after we come back from this quick break. You said you're no longer in Kiev. Where are you now, brother? I'm in Lviv right now. And so <clears throat> the reason why I'm in Lviv is that I was following a good friend of mine, Andre um, Konolinko, who has been doing a lot of the driving. I mean, I know that you've, I think I've talked to you about some of the, the families that have helped to get to the border. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Andre, he's doing, he did all the driving. And so we're a team and he was embedded with a volunteer group of people who were armed, protecting checkpoints. He shifted his role to doing more humanitarian stuff, which is why I'm in mm. Lviv with him. Mm. And so that's where I'm at right now. Mm. I want to talk about a, a, a couple of different angles of this one uh, last week uh, on the show. We got wind of the African students who were being treated um, at gunpoint by the uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Um, we had a chance yeah. to unpack it, but we didn't have a chance to speak with you about it. What are your thoughts about that entire situation? Yeah. So thank you for, for asking me that question about the African students. So. I think one of the things um, that we have to look at with this, you know, one, it was happening. And then two, uh, there is um, the government did respond to it. And, you know, I'm not carrying anybody's water, but there are a number of people, elected officials who, who once they caught wind of it, they went on Twitter themselves and they apologized for mm. this behavior. And so, again, let's be clear. It happened. Right. We saw all that stuff. It was clear. It's deplorable. But also this type of behavior is consistent with how, you know, with racism that happened long before, you know, this mm. even happened. Right. And so this racism and it's not just Ukraine. It was also, you know, you think about Poland, you think about all these other places, like all this stuff existed before the war. It's just that when you have these refugee conflicts, it exacerbates the racism. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, so now I think that, you know, it's shifting a bit right now because there are plenty of African students to get to the border and they have no problem at all. And those are things mm -hmm. that I've seen personally that have been confirmed by people that I have seen. So this issue is very complex. And so the reason why it's very complex is that there are several hot spots in Ru in Ukraine, particularly Sumi. And here's some, right? And so those are in the east. And, and so you have situations where these cities are surrounded by Russian soldiers. And there's just cases where many of them, they just can't get out. And so you, so, so particularly in Sumi. And so you have situations, and, and that's something where I'm trying to work through right now. How can I best help these students who can't even escape? And so, mm -hmm. and, and you just, they're going through corridors that Russia will recognize, right? Because there are supposed to be green corridors through which non-combatants are going through, but the Russians are shooting at them, right? And so, mm. and so I've tried to contact a number of students in some of these hotspot areas, but because they're probably in bunkers, they're just difficult to get to. And so that's something that I'm working right. on as well. But you know, the thing about right. border, the thing about border politics is that you have situations where <clears throat> You know, I've even had to grow and understand my own passport privilege that I have in this situation. And so uh, I don't know if I even told you this, but I, when, I, when I asked for the first family, uh, I was in the Ukrainian line because I was escorting them to get through the border. And if you're an American citizen, you can go to the EU without any problem. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I think that when you uh, once you're a refugee, you're all going to the same place. Doesn't matter. And so it's complex in that you have these uh, there's they they focus on the Ukrainian women and children first. Like that's who they're sending mm -hmm. to get out of the country. I get that. The problem is that when you get to the border, it's not that they have this foreigner line, which again, interesting enough, I wasn't in. Um, mm -hmm. I was in, even though I am a foreigner, right? I am right, but I'm American. And I just never thought, and I just never thought about getting in any other line, but getting in the line where I can get to have the least resistance. And so I'm just, just keeping it real, right? You know, just no, keeping, no, I understand. Keeping yeah, it real. So, so basically, um, interesting enough, in this, um, in, with this first family, I'm, a, I'm in contact with a guy named Shane as a, as a British guy, and. So I've been keeping in contact with him over the few days. I'm helping his family get to the border because, you know, in order to get to the border, if you're driving, it's 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 uh, it takes a couple of days. You got to go through dozens of checkpoints um, and, and it's, just, it's just a lot more difficult. You have to depend on people to give you housing because you can't go on Airbnb and, and, right. and get anything because right. it's just not available. Right. And so we we made it just solely on our personal contacts, me and Andre's contacts. That's how we made it in getting these people to and from places i you know my huge following on social media um i said hey i need a place to stay here and people say i got you my mama got you my cousin mm. got you somebody that's got beautiful. you you know what i'm saying so that's so so that's, right. that's how i was able to navigate but the point of it is talking about like being a refugee is expensive dude like so mm. uh and catching things so just a brief digression this place in Lviv, i found it um and um in order to like get this place for eight days i had to pay a thousand bucks Wow. So so my whole wow. point of view is so when, so, so when people are donating and, and, and giving me money for my work, it's going to things like that. Mm. So, you know, because it, it's not like I was trying to, it was just the best option that was available for me. And so, right. so just imagine if you're some refugee that's coming through and you didn't plan for a war and you need a place to stay, they don't have a thousand dollars. I mean, hell, these people are making five hundred dollars a month. Okay. Wow. You get what I'm saying? Wow. And so basically, my going back to Shane, I'm communicating with Shane. This is a couple of weeks ago. I'm saying, hey, and he, Shane said, where are you? What's your status? Because we're at the border in Slovakia waiting on you. This family that I'm taking, me and Andre, following us around like ducks because they're scared and they're traumatized and they were in a bunker for three days straight. Uh, when I get to the border, you... Um, we get past the border and then waiting for this family with Shane, who is another black man, a black British man. And so here's the irony of this. All right. You talk about the inequities about being a refugee. And so and you talk about how Europe is welcoming these kind of white refugees in and all this other jazz. Right. And so you see the inequity. Now, this family, depending on a black person to get them through. Get mm. them to the border. And then waiting on mm. the other side of it was another black man. And we both come from countries that were or that are empires that wow. um that 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 at one point enslaved our people. Think about mm. that. That's Think that's a lot of interconnected complicatedness, man. That's a lot going on there. That's um uh, and the irony is not lost upon me. Um was it Finish your thought, because I feel like you were going to say something else with that, because that is that that is that is simultaneously beautiful, ironic and painful to see. Yeah. So so basically, look, again, you know me, Ben, and you know me, you know that you, you know me when I was covering domestic when I covered domestic politics. So you understand how I cover things, how I see things. So. It, was, it never was a doubt in my mind that I was going to stay and help these people. Mm. Because what mm. drives me to do this is my faith, right? And so even though people, because ultimately this war is a breakdown and failure in humanity. That's what it comes down to. Say word and word. even though I see a dearth of humanity, and how my people are treated, I will never lose my 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 understanding of others' humanity. I will mm. never lose that, and that is mm. and that is a Christian that is a Christian faith based approach. 
not one of That's man. Right. Because if I because if I was be followed by man, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be you doing. You got out of there a long time ago. That's right. You, right, right. That's right. A long time ago, and because the thing, and so basically, again, the inequities that we're talking about, oh, they're definitely clear. But at the same time, what I'm trying to navigate in my own journalism and then in my own work outside of journalism is I hope what I'm doing is bringing everyone's humanity to light and realize that when we think about white supremacy, when we think about um, these systems of oppression, mm. they hurt all of us. They harm That's right. all of us. And my word to Ukrainians is that, yes, you are oppressed under Putin, but when you go to the United States, when you go to the Euro when you go to the European Union, I want you to remember what this oppression felt like and don't join the imperial oppressors framework and then turn okay. on and oppress us. Okay. Well now, that's a tall order. I, 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 I've been listening to everything you're saying, man, and I'm with you 100%, and I pray that that's what happens. But how many times have we seen through history when, you know, because of the melanin count, they blend in? But we're not going to, we'll, we'll see what history says. We're not going to hold, we're not going to hold them to that yet, but we'll see what history says about this. Uh, yeah, Terrell, I want to help support. I, I want to help support what you're doing, man. Can you and and David, if you don't mind, uh, getting his cash app and putting it on the screen because I know uh, I know you're over there. Um, you're doing the work, and I know the place from which you're doing the work. And I want to make sure that we and there it is on the screen. Your cash app is uh, uh, dollar sign Terrell J Star. So anyone who has some extra coins that you could send his way to support him, as he's not only doing journalism, um, he's not only doing humanitarian work. But if there's some uh, some faith people out there, he's out there doing some faith work as well, man. So, uh, Terrell, I want to salute you, brother. You stay safe over there with all trying to save the world and stuff. You say you make sure you're safe. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. And anytime you say I want to talk to you, you got my time. So I, I cleared the schedule for you. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. And I'm going to let you get back to the rest of your day, man. Be safe. Cash app this brother. Uh, cash app dollar sign Terrell J star. Brother, we'll have you back. Be safe and we'll talk with you soon.